When did it all go wrong? Why did Arabs and Jews start hating each other? Is it because of Judaism? Is it because of Islam? Is it about oil? Money? Unlikely, as for over 1,300 years, since the very beginning of Islam, Jews and Muslims lived together in an unprecedented religious and cultural harmony in Palestine, North Africa, and Spain. It all seemed to be going just fine till the 20th century. But then something happened. And ever since, Jews and Arabs had been at each other's throats. Basel and Switzerland have possibly something to do with how it all went wrong. Basel was the setting for the first Zionist convention in 1897. Zionism was a national Jewish revival movement that sought to unite all Jews in a national homeland. They just weren't sure where that homeland was. Up until 1897, there were all kinds of crazy ideas thrown into the air, like Uganda, Alaska, Madagascar, and other less exotic destinations. In Basel, however, the Zionist movement decided on an ideal and historically relevant location, Palestine. But what if the people who were already living in Palestine didn't want to have a national Jewish home set up in their country? The Zionists had some clear ideas about that problem from the very beginning. Theodor Herzl, considered to be the founder of Zionism, wrote in 1895, we shall try to spirit away the penniless population across the border. Leo Motzkin, one of Zionism's most liberal thinkers, wrote, The colonization of Palestine has to go in two directions. Jewish settlements in Eretz Israel and the resettlement of Arabs in areas outside the country. Chaim Weizmann, the head of the World Zionist Congress and future president of Israel, proclaimed the Palestinians to be the rocks of Judea, obstacles that need to be cleared on a difficult path. Amazing how little have changed in Judea since then. The, the, the Jewish people came into this country, said this is our country, and they didn't say it's our country, but we recognize that there's another people living here. Let's 
see what we can work out. No, the whole idea of Israel until today is this is our country from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, and it's only our country. It's exclusively our country. There is no other people. There's a bunch of Arabs living here, that we know. But there's no people, there's no other people with a claim to the country, with a legitimate right to the country. This is our country exclusively, and therefore, either you shut up, if you're a Palestinian, and you live in one of the little islands we'll give you, by sufferance, not by right, or get out. But back to the story. At the end of the 19th century, there were hardly any Jews living in Palestine. So the Zionists started campaigning all over the world for Jews to immigrate to Palestine. In Zionist vocabulary, this is called Aliyah, which means to ascend to a higher place. I'm not kidding. Most Jews thought the idea sounded like a pitch for a horror movie and decided to immigrate to the U.S. instead. But some Jews bought the whole ascending thing and actually came to Palestine. The Zionists also launched Operation Biostate. They went and bought all the land they could from Palestinian absentee landlords. Once the land was theirs, they threw out all the Palestinians that were living on it. The Zionists called this process Judifying the Land and Land Redemption. Terms that, surprise, surprise, are still being used in current Israel regarding government policies. Then, in 1917, things changed. The British conquered Palestine from the Turks. They legalized the Jewish national home idea with the Balfour Declaration in the same year. Palestine became a special case because the British violated the provisions of the Mandate for Palestine because they put the Balfour Declaration into the Palestine Mandate, you see. What did this mean? It meant that for Palestine, the wishes of the inhabitants, 90% Arab, would not be listened to, and they would not be developed for independence. It would be Jews, once they came in through immigration, you see, they would be allowed to develop. And so it's really with the Palestinian Mandate and the violation of the mandatory provisions to give the Zionists the right to create a majority of Jews to create a Palestinian state, that the the real Palestinian Zionist conflict begins. With very few illusions on both sides. The Palestinians launched two popular uprisings against the Jews and the British blatant pro-Zionist policies. The first took place in 1929 and claimed hundreds of Palestinians and Jewish lives. The second, in 1936, was practically a small-scale war between the Palestinians and the British, who were also aided by the Zionists. It lasted for three years, and in the end, approximately 5,000 Palestinians died. The British also exiled the Palestinians' leadership and dismantled all Palestinians' paramilitary units. The Palestinians were left defenseless and leaderless. Uh, Most of the Israeli commanders have studied the British reaction to the Palestinian revolt in 1936 and 1939, which became the manual book of what to do to the Palestinians in case of resistance. In fact, most of the of the atrocities you read about, and I'm sure most of you in this place know about it, most of the atrocities that you enlist as severe violations of human rights and civil rights 
in Palestine today. Most of these violations were invented not by the Jewish Zionist mind, but by British mandatory authorities in the war against the Palestinians between 1936 to 1939. Examples, the idea that you demolish houses of people is a British invention. The idea that in order to make a search memorable to people, you destroy a house and then you move to the other house, and then to the other house, and then to the other house, was an invention by British officers on the ground. The idea that you shoot people without warning them, or you arrest them without trial, it's all from the reservoir of the mandatory uh, anti-Arab, uh, uh, anti uh, um, measures in 1936 to 1939. But of course the Israelis added their own uh, uh, brutal and callous uh, uh, ideas uh, as we went, as, as the occupation uh, continued. Then, in the 1940s, the cards turned. Following a string of British pro-Palestinian policies, the Zionists launched terrorist attacks on British personnel and facilities. Violence continues to rule in Palestine. British soldiers seek bodies in the Department of Labor building at Chesnik, where a few minutes before, a blast had partially wrecked the edifice. Three policemen were blown to bits when they tried to remove an explosive-laden truck. Shaky walls are torn down. After a bomb explosion caused by terrorists on the British headquarters of Jerusalem, one entire corner of the King David Hotel, a building of seven stories, was razed to the ground. The stone floors were cut... 88 innocent people died and a good deal of the British High Command was wiped out. Their goal was to drive the British out of Palestine. The mastermind of the King David bombing was Menachem Begin. He would become Israel Prime Minister. His accomplice, Yitzhak Shamil, would also later become Prime Minister. The pattern of terrorists, or, in other words, brutal military leaders transforming into top politicians, is very common in Israeli politics. At this point, the British have had enough, and they transferred the matter of Palestine to the UN. The United Nations uh, sent a uh, committee to evaluate this in the summer of '47, and they recommended partition. And the Zionists eagerly accepted this, and the Palestinian Arabs didn't, because they were still two-thirds of the population, and they felt this was unjust. And but nonetheless, this partition, which was approved uh, in the UN after Thanksgiving in 1947, officially recognized two states. In 1947, the Jews owned 5.8% of the land. In the UN partition plan, the Jews ended up with 56% of the land almost ten times of what they actually owned. The Palestinians had half of their land stolen right under their noses. Their population was split into two, half of it living in the Zionist state as a minority. Even in the borders of the Jewish state, the Jews owned only 11 percent of the land. The United States? Yes? Yugoslavia, abstain. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. Why would the UN be so blatantly pro-Zionist? To not underestimate the power of guilt. Anyone heard of the Holocaust? The UN sought to compensate the Jews over the deaths of six million Jews in World War II. 
murdered by the Germans. And they decided that the Palestinians should pay for it. Makes perfect sense. However, this amount of land, more than half of Palestine, was still not enough for the Zionists. David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist movement in Palestine, wrote in 1937, The Arabs will have to go. But one needs an opportune moment for making it happen. Such as a war. The Palestinians had no desire to fight the Zionists or start a war. They were used to living under different sovereigns for hundreds of years. Egyptians, Turks, British, and now the Zionists. In 1948, Ben-Gurion tells the Jewish agency executives, I believe that the majority of the Palestinian masses accept the partition as fait accompli and do not believe it is possible to overcome or reject it. The decisive majority of them do not want to fight us. Towards the end of 1947, the Zionist leadership came together and drew Plan Dalit. Plan Dalit was about securing the borders of Israel by cleansing, expelling, and destroying Palestinian towns, villages, and urban neighborhoods. The plan was implemented by the Zionist armed forces. And finally, in March, they began a push to ensure their control of areas that would become Israel under the partition. And as that happened, you began to get many more Palestinian Arabs fleeing, uh, particularly after a massacre at a place called Deir Yassin, although people now think it was probably somewhat over 100, but not 200. But Begin and uh, the Urgun and the Stern gang, Yitzhak Shamir was part of that, there was a combined attack in this Palestinian village that uh, massacred many people. And the Palestinians did carry out a retaliatory raid, killing about 70 uh, Jewish doctors on, on the road to Jerusalem shortly thereafter. But after that, you had mobile radio bands, the Begin put into play, uh, threatening more Deir Yassin if the Arabs didn't flee. In other words, you'll be massacred just like Deir Yassin. So it became part of the propaganda. Between the 30th of March and 15th of May, 1948, 200 villages were occupied and their inhabitants expelled. In some villages, such as Deir Yassin and Ain al-Zaytun, horrible massacres were perpetrated. The towns of Tiberias, Haifa, Tzfat, Beisan, Jaffa, and Accra fell into Zionist hands. As a result, more than 250,000 Palestinians were expelled. All of this took place before the 1948 war even started, before one regular Arab soldier set his foot on Palestinian soil. I became a refugee when I was in a boarding school about 40 kilometers away from my home place. And in April 1948, the headmaster came to us and said, the Jews are attacking people around Tel Aviv, in Jaffa area. They will soon come to our area. I cannot protect you, so you better go home now quite a bit early, maybe six weeks early, before the end of the scholastic year. And I was about 10 at the time, and the distance between 
the boarding school and my home is about 40 to 60 kilometers depending on how you do it. And the road to uh, my home was cut off frequently by uh, Zionist soldiers who were riding in jeeps and the jeeps I remember clearly had two machine guns, one pointing forward and the other one pointing backward. And so they would go at terrific speed uh, in, in the area in which they have no uh, physical presence except they have garrisons of 30 soldiers in certain locations. They would terrify the farmers and they would drive on the roads and in the fields and they shoot anybody in sight. So I have uh, a cousin who was older than me, about 20 years age at that time, and he said, let us walk back home. And he advised us that if you see these jeeps coming, you have to um, hide in the wheat field, which was then very much in evidence, uh, and uh, uh, until the, you, you hear the sound of the jeep going away. So we did that, and on the way, I had to throw away my bag, uh, you know, uh, my clothes and my books, and we had to walk about 40 kilometers, terrified as a child that one moment we see the jeep and they, they would kill us. When I arrived home, uh, my mother was, was so, so sad, and I, uh, I think I remember I had to sleep for about two days after this ordeal. Now, only six weeks later, uh, precisely on the 14th, the night of 14th and 15th of May, our home was attacked again by about 24 tanks, um, which came uh, to cut Gaza Strip. My home is close to Gaza Strip, but not in Gaza Strip. Uh, to cut it into two, to cut the Gaza Strip into two. And um, they came, and we have my brothers and cousins and so on, they had some old guns. They held them from about 10 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock next morning. But finally, of course, they could not um, continue to resist, and the Zionists came, and they blew up our homes and burned them. Uh, they also uh, blew up the school which my father built in 1920. It's a primary school, um, which was our pride because uh, my father built that school at his expense in 1920 when he had no children. Um, they also blew the what's called bayara, which is a well with motorized well from which we drink and also we water our gardens and plantations. Um, since that time, I spent many, many uh, days and years, in fact, um, going through um, Europe, Europe's libraries, especially in London, but also in Paris and in uh, Germany and Istanbul, trying to reconstruct the face of that invisible enemy to me, which destroyed my life ever since, until today. What did we do to them? I never saw a Jew in my life. I never saw, of course, a Zionist soldier in my life. And uh, I had to construct even not only who they were, but the names of the officers who destroyed my life. It is important to note that during that time, the British had almost 70,000 troops in Palestine. Their mandate which lasted until the 15th of May, 1948, was to maintain law and order and to protect civilians. They failed miserably in that obligation. While the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians was going on, the Zionists were busy announcing to the world that a second Holocaust was imminent. The Jews were about to be overrun and thrown into the sea. At the same time, in February 1948, 
Ben Gurion wrote to his foreign minister, We will be able not only to defend, but also to take over Palestine as a whole. I am in no doubt of this. We can face all the Arab forces. Confident of their victory, the Zionists declared independence on the 14th of May, 1948. And Ben Gurion became the first Prime Minister. On the 15th of May, 1948, seven Arab countries declared war on Israel and invaded Palestine. In a joint public statement, they explained their reasons. The Zionist aggression in Palestine resulted in the exodus of more than a quarter of a million of its Arab inhabitants and in their taking refuge in the neighboring Arab countries. In the beginning of the 1948 war, the Arab forces amounted to approximately 22,000 fighters. The Zionists had 40,000 soldiers. The Jordanians had an army that would have even the odds. However, King Abdallah decided to set this one out. Instead, he defended only the bits he wanted to attach to Jordan, Jerusalem and the West Bank. Uh, and one of the myths of this whole period is that you had a little Israel, uh, small Zionists against the Palestinians, and then later on in the war, when the Arab states invaded, that it was David versus Goliath, they were o facing overwhelming odds, and this is simply not true. Because even then, Israel, from May of 48 on, had more troops than the Arab states, who had very small armies. See what I mean? So, but that's one of those things that many people believe. When you had the Arab state invasion, uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, you had Iraqi troops, you had some Saudi, the Lebanese did very little, and you had the Transjordanians. This will become Jordan, which includes the West Bank after uh, 1948. Well, when they invaded, there was no coordination because no one trusted Abdullah of Transjordan because he had been dealing with the Zionists in sort of what we might call a non-aggression pact. Although many Israeli historians deny this vociferously, there clearly were uh, discussions and agreements. And although maps show that when you have this attack, you have what we call a Transjordanian attack against Israel, in fact, there was really no attack per se. They were holding on to positions in the West Bank. But where you did have conflict was over Jerusalem. But the Israelis were able, the Zionists, well, they were Israelis after May 14th. When they were confronting the Egyptians, for example, or other people, they really didn't have to worry about their backs in terms of uh, where the Jordanians were, because the Jordanians weren't going to attack them. While the war was going on, the Zionists increased their ethnic cleansing operations. Villagers were expelled en masse, and massacres occurred in many places. The villages of Hula, Salia, and Basa were but a few to suffer such atrocities during 1948. Once Zionist troops occupied the village that resisted them, they would round up all the men according to lists the intelligence officers would provide. On the whim of the local commander, they would either shoot them or march them away. The biggest expulsion and massacre happened in the city of Lid Ramle. 50,000 people were expelled from the city in a single day.
426 men, women, and children were killed by the Zionist forces. The general in charge of the occupation and expulsion of Lee Dramle was Yitzhak Rabin, who would later become Israel Prime Minister, serving two terms. In 1948, the Chicago Sunday Times reported on the Israeli tactics. Practically everything in their way died. Riddled corpses lay by the side of the roads. The New York Herald Tribune wrote, The corpses of Arab men, women, and even children strewn about in the wake of the ruthlessly brilliant charge. The London Economist reported the Arab refugees were systematically stripped of all of their belongings. Then they were sent on their trek to the frontier. صاروا يطخوا نحن اخر شيء طلعنا على الارض قعدنا برا وشتا بتشارين بتشارين شو شتا عندنا شتا 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 ما بدناش نطلع ما بدنا نطلع اجوا وجي صفونا انا بحكي عن بيت اهلي يعني صفونا كلياتنا هيك وبدنا نرجع صرخت لهم امي قالت لكم دخلكم نحن بنطلع من بنقعد بالشتا برا وما تقتلوا فاتوا على البلد هاجموا اخر هجوم لا غير الختياريات ما كانوش كم واحد لسه متخبيات بالبلد محل هيك تبان هذا حطوا فيه تبن للبقر بخزنوا لسه متخبي هو مع الختياريات ولد عمره 16 سنه ياسر علوطي اسمه كانت دار هنا هون عند حارة المنزول لسه اطلعوا معهم من مع النسوان طلعوهن لما استهدوا عليهم طلعوهن فاتت وراي مرت خالي قلت لك بدك اطلعي شو هتشوفي بتقدريش يا كتير الغلبه قالت لي الا تفوتي اطلعي قعدت مده احلم فيه هذا الولد كيف كانت شكلك The Arab armies succeeded in occupying several remote Jewish settlements for a few days. They also successfully attacked army convoys. But the final victory, unsurprisingly, belonged to the Zionists. They conquered 80% of Palestine destroyed 531 villages, 11 urban neighborhoods and towns. Approximately 750,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed and were forced to leave everything behind as they fled for their lives. However, the ethnic cleansing didn't stop in 1948. It just shifted gear. In 1967, in the Six-Day War, Israel conquered what was left of Palestine, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, the remaining 20% of Palestine and all the Palestinians were under Zionist control. So it was really the whole spectrum of Zionist views from left to right were represented in the government that made the most important decisions. 
on the future of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip on the 19th of June 1967. And the decision was very clear. The decision was, there were actually three decisions taken at the time, and I don't think much, unfortunately, has changed. The first decision was that unlike 1948, the Israeli government cannot decide on the mass expulsion of the Palestinians from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. It was for me, looking at that document, a reaffirmation, if I needed one, that the Israeli political elite was aware of the ethnic cleansing it committed in 1948. So in 1967, they said very loud and clear, we cannot do what we did in 1948. They say very clearly in their documents. So they can't expel. Not that it prevented them from expelling hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from the West Bank, in particular but also from the Gaza Strip. Uh, but this was not similar to the ethnic cleansing of 1948 because it was not a systematic mass expulsion of the people from their country. It was expulsion of locations uh, according to different strategic considerations of the Israeli army that wanted to downsize the number of Palestinians under Israeli control. So the first decision was not to continue the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in the same way that it was committed in 1948. The second decision was that unlike the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, which the Israelis occupied in 1967 as well, unlike those two territories, which the Israeli government at the time recognized as belonging respectively to Egypt and Syria, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were part of Israel forever. To keep the territories as part of Israel without expelling the people. And that of course led to the third decision. If you keep the territories and you don't expel the people, what do you do with the people? Do you turn them into Israeli citizens? Do you annex officially the territories to Israel? And the third decision was to create what, and this is my words, not their words, but to create a mega prison. To create an amazing human invention that not only the Zionist ideology could produce. The idea that you can lock, lock at the time million and a half now, double the number of million and a half, that you can lock them in a regime that is similar to the concept of a prison. With all kinds of variations on the, on, on the prison concept. It can be an open prison if the inmates behave themselves. They can even go and work outside, provided they come back to be in the prison at the end of the day. Uh, they can have autonomy in the prison. They can run their life as they wish, provided they accept the concept. Should they resist, the Israeli government would move quickly into a high security prison with all the punitive measures that uh, harsh uh, wardens would take against uh, inmates in such a situation. Under the army's protection and with the government's aid, Israeli settlements were erected in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Today, they cut through the Palestinian land and keep spreading. Some of them, like Ariel and Maalea Dumim, are already considered to be cities. The purpose of these Jewish enclaves is to isolate and stifle Palestinian settlements. This is achieved also through roads for Jews only, military checkpoints, and land seizure. But we want a Palestinian state, the Bantu stand, because we have to relieve ourselves of the Palestinian population, but it can't be a viable state. You see? And that's where the Bantu stand idea comes in. So there are four elements on the ground that have created that Bantu stand. And if you look at a map, we even have maps that show almost exactly the borders of this emerging Bantu stand. One are areas A and B. 
the areas that were reserved for Palestinians during Oslo, the Oslo peace process. And that locks the Palestinians into these islands already on about 42% of the West Bank. Then, in addition to creating the contours of the state by areas A and B, Israel has created massive settlement blocks. Seven settlement blocks, not just discrete individual settlements, but seven blocks that are consolidated, that then divide those areas A and B into islands, create Israeli corridors in between, and those settlement blocks will then be annexed to Israel. So Israel will essentially occupy 90% of the country, and the Palestinians will get 10% of the country in little tiny islands. That's the idea. That's the second element. The third element is the infrastructure. In other words, that Israel is building, with American, almost total American support, a $3 billion system of bypass roads and highways throughout the occupied territories that then link them physically into Israel proper. So that you create in the country, it's already been done pretty much, one urban fabric where the settlement blocks are an integral part of the metropolitan areas of Israel itself. One highway grid in which the bypass roads and highways of the West Bank and Gaza are integrated into those of Israel. One electrical system, one water system. So you create a situation on the ground where it's impossible to detach meaningful territory uh, from Israel for a Palestinian state. That's the third element. And the fourth element is uh, the wall that's being built. The wall that's being built that Israel calls a fence, because in some parts it's a massive fence, but when it comes to Palestinian populated areas, it becomes a wall. It's a wall twice as high as the Berlin Wall. A 24-foot high concrete wall that physically creates actual prison conditions for entire Palestinian cities like Tul Karm and Kalkilia, cities of 70, 80,000 people that alienates hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their land, from their water. Uh, it has tremendous impact. But what this wall does, the separation wall, is that it then sets these uh, contours, these borders that have been set by the settlement blocks in areas A and B in concrete so that it's a two billion dollar system linked to a three billion dollar highway system linked to I don't know how many billions of dollars in the settlements all designed to close to close the Palestinians into these little tiny islands. <laughs> Palestinians rose up against the Israeli oppression in two popular uprisings, or intifadas. The first started in 1987 and ended in 1993. The Palestinians stood up to the Israeli oppression, extrajudicial killings, mass detentions, house demolitions, deportations, and land seizure. They were no match for the well-equipped Israeli army. Over 1,100 Palestinians died during the uprising, and many more were imprisoned or expelled. The first intifada was put down by the Israeli government with so much brutality that the UN condemned Israel for violating the Geneva Conventions. The Intifada succeeded, however, in bringing the Palestinian case to the attention of the world. It also heralded the schizophrenic path that the Palestinian resistance would take from now on. While peaceful, non-violent demonstrations were conducted, Suicide bombers entered Israel and blew up buses packed with people. 
the Second Intifada began in 2000 and continues until today. So far, it has claimed the lives of over 5,300 Palestinians and over a thousand Israelis. While it was raging, the only true democratic elections in the whole Arab world took place in the West Bank and Gaza. الحكومة الفلسطينية العاشرة برئاسة رئيس الوزراء الفلسطيني المكلف الأخ إسماعيل هنية قد منحت الثقة بالأغلبية المطلقة لأعضاء المجلس التشريعي Frustrated with their corrupt, stagnant government Palestinians voted for the radical fundamentalist Muslim party of Hamas. Hamas electoral victory was used by Israel to instigate a worldwide economic embargo against the Palestinians. Also at that time 10,000 Jewish settlers were evacuated from the Gaza Strip. After the evacuation the Strip was hermetically sealed and turned into the largest prison on the planet. Israel controls all sea, land and air access to Gaza. It regularly cuts off all food, water and power supply to the Strip. In order to punish the population for their defiance, in response to bombing by F-16 jets and Apache helicopter gunships targeted assassinations, Palestinians fire homemade rockets at Israeli settlements. The political and military elite of Israel since 1967 until 2008, 2008 has stuck to the same strategic decision about the occupied territories. That this area cannot be annexed to Israel as long as it has a large Palestinian population in it. This hasn't changed. This is still what Israel is all about when it comes to these two parts of Palestine, the West Bank and the Gaza. Secondly, that the Palestinians can at best be have an open prison concept that would even be called a state, that's okay, as long as they accept a total Israeli control of their life mm -hmm. through a bureaucracy that runs uh, every aspect of their being and existence, uh, where the main uh, uh, coin or the main trading card is collaboration with the bureaucracy in return for opening a kiosk, a business, going to university, being appointed as a teacher, going abroad, moving from one village to the other. This is the main formula. But it was decided upon in 1967. Not contrary to what we hear today, that these are all Israeli measures that are countering uh, Palestinian terrorist attacks or violence. It's quite amazing how the history documents show that all these retaliatory, supposedly retaliatory Israeli actions were Israeli decisions against which the Palestinians retaliated. Not the other way around, including the war. The war was already decided upon in 1967. Mm -hmm. it was not, the war was not built as a reaction to the suicide bombs. The war was a natural consequence of the mega prison. Once it was clear that the Palestinians, by and large, are not happy with the mega prison. Or it took them 20 years to show it. doesn't matter. But it was very clear. So, uh, in this respect, this is the second thing, is, is that the, the Israeli policy is about maintaining, perfecting the mega prison. And the inevitable happened. It really looks like a prison. Mm -hmm. It didn't look like a prison in 1967. It looks like a prison. The bureaucracy became really prison wardens. They were not to begin with. And finally, and with this I would end, the greatest, maybe, Israeli success, which I hope this meeting and others would prove that this is a failure, but it is not yet a failure. The greatest uh, uh, success 
is that 41 years onwards, these Israeli policies are not known. Definitely the fact that they were taken in 1967 and hasn't changed is not known. And that the Israeli very simplistic demand, not very sophisticated, very transparent lies about what they are doing, that any intelligent person could easily decipher and expose for what they are, are still being repeated by the mainstream media in the West, including the Guardian, by, by the, all the te mainstream television networks, including the BBC and ITV and Sky News and what have you, and is accepted by all the political elites of the West, including, of course, the British government. Today, Israel continues to steal Palestinian land in order to build more and more settlements. The security wall that Israel erected is instrumental in this, as it encloses a large portion of the West Bank's most fertile land. Three and a half million Palestinians live as virtual prisoners. In the eyes of the Israeli state, they have no basic human rights. Israel kidnaps and imprisons Palestinians on a daily basis. There are over 10,000 Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Men, women and children are killed almost daily for opposing the occupation. The Israeli state with its Zionist ideology won't stop until the last Palestinian living in Palestine is expelled, imprisoned, controlled or killed. The Palestinians who live in Israel are treated as second-class citizens. They are excluded from the society and are subjugated by racist policies. Now we're starting to see the settlement. This is the beginning of the settlement to be. They gave it in the name of Kidmat Zion, which is a very religious name. And it is uh, to absorb uh, around 250 housing units, which means nothing less than 15,000 new settlers. The settlers who moved here are members of the fanatic ideological settlement movement called Gosh Imunim. So those are the new neighbors that we have, the fanatic ideological settlers. And uh, you can see that they have not just the army to protect them and, you know, to, be, to enslave them, but also they have special uh, uh, guarding uh, agents that are sitting on top of their house. So we see that sometimes when the women are getting down to throw the garbage, she, have, she has a bodyguard in front and the bodyguard behind. When the women and their children are moving out of the neighborhood, there is a bodyguard car in front and the bodyguard out behind. And those bodyguards, by the way, are not paid by the government. They are paid by my taxes as a taxpayer because these are private security companies for, that are, you know, you know, paid by my taxes for special requests based on security needs. And of course, the security needs are not to protect me as a taxpayer, but to protect the illegal settlers that are moving on my land against my will. And that's the controversial reality that we here live in. Because these are not only the lands that were confiscated. Behind the mountain, you have a vast majority of lands that are owned by Abudis overnight were announced as confiscated areas for security reasons and uh, they won't allow me to move around because at one point I'm sure the security will follow me but I wish I could take you, you know, like you see the wall zigzagging in and out Palestinians out, Israelis and empty land in in order to grab all that empty lands for the expansion of a settlement to be
Now, the bigger picture of Jerusalem that the Israeli municipality is not even hiding is the issue of metropolitan Jerusalem, the, the master plan 2020-2020 for the metropolitan of Jerusalem, where if you follow the route of the wall, it is bringing Palestinian neighborhoods out and bringing illegal Israeli settlements in to the metropolitan of Jerusalem. For example, Abu Dis, you see how Abu Dis is adjacent to Jerusalem. It's okay. like within walking distance, five minutes walking distance, you're in Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. Internationally, historically, this is Jerusalem. But Abu Dis, with its population, you know, concentrated Palestinian population, is out of the master plan for Jerusalem, whereas Ma'ali Adumim settlement that is built on Abu Dis land, if, uh, you know, like five kilometers from here, is into the master plan of Jerusalem because of their Jewish majority or their Jewish existence. The same thing for uh, Bethlehem area. Bethlehem, the city of Jesus, is out of Jerusalem, uh, you know, metropolitan, although it's 12 kilometers drive. It's like 12 minutes drive literally between center Jerusalem and center Bethlehem. But because it's concentrated Palestinian area, it is out of the metropolitan of Jerusalem. But Gosh Etzion blocks, settlement blocks that are 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem are within the metropolitan of Jerusalem because of their Jewish population. So the metropolitan of Jerusalem is so clear, racist, apartheid, whatever you want to call it, Jews in, Palestinians out. So this is the bigger picture. And the internal picture is with the Israeli Jewish fanatics that we have to deal in. So you have fanatics on the ground, you have fanatics at decision-making level. You tell me what is the way out. Generally, the Palestinian opposition takes the form of peaceful, non-violent protests, like in the village of Bilin and Nialin. But from time to time, it also takes the form of suicide attacks, when desperate young men, feeling they have nothing to live for, explode themselves in Israeli cities. There is no opposition to Zionism in Israel. There are only small, insignificant groups that remain almost invisible and ignored in Israeli society. And their focus is almost exclusively on the West Bank occupation and the Gaza siege. None of the existing peace organizations in Israel is concerned or even interested in the real causes of the conflict. One of the biggest opposition groups comprises of some 50 anarchists, most of them still in high school. They joined peaceful Palestinian demonstrations in West Bank villages and end up playing cat and mouse with the soldiers pursuing them through the hills. Another group, Gush Shalom, is mainly made up of senior citizens just like combatants for peace and a few other tiny groups. Gush Shalom is not against Zionist policies as a whole. It only specifically protests against the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza siege. In this situation, it is hard to even determine how positive the impact of those leftist organizations is. After all, their very existence convinces most Israelis and the world that Israel is an open, free, democratic state. The real, desperately needed discussion about the ultimate fate of the remaining Palestinians simply does not exist. <laughs> 
All the parties in the Israeli parliament, from right to left, are Zionist. In Israeli society, and increasingly in the outside world, it is only permissible to question the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza siege. Anyone who questions the occupation of Palestine and the catastrophe Zionism brought on Palestinians is ostracized, silenced, called an anti-Semite or, in case of a Jew, a self-hating Jew. I don't think that we can uh, implement a full right of return for however many Palestinians do want to return uh, and still maintain the integrity of the state of Israel as a democratic Jewish state as we in Israel would like to have it. So I think we're going to have to look for a compromise on the right of return, a compromise that will both acknowledge the suffering uh, and um, and give some forms of reparation uh, and help Palestinian refugees uh, uh, integrate into where, whatever countries they are in today uh, and accept some back into Israel. But in, uh, we'll also have implementation on a level that Israel can live with and still maintain itself as, as Israel and not as the state of the Palestinian refugees. I am not afraid when I will be called to, to war, if the Palestinians try to attack my country, I will defend my country, like I defend my country against the Egyptians, against the Syrians, against the Hezbollah, against everyone else. I don't think that that should be our consideration when, when we go, go to think whether or not to pull back from the territories, because as I have already explained, every minute of our being in the territories is harmful to Israel, is exposing Israel for more terrorist attacks, and the Israeli Defense Force is not built to fight terrorist attacks. It is built to fight countries. Activist groups everywhere, of all faiths and none, who campaign for justice and peace, need to ask themselves some uncomfortable questions about how effective really they have been, and more to the point, what they must do to be more effective. In my view, there are two political realities to be faced. The first is that Zionism is not interested and has never been interested in peace on any terms the overwhelming majority of Palestinians and most Muslims could accept. The second is that the governments of the major Western powers are never ever, never ever going to use the leverage they have to call and hold the Zionist state to account for its crimes unless unless they are pushed to do so by informed public opinion by manifestations of democracy in action. Now as I sit on this very platform in November 2006, and I think it bears repeating, the problem throughout the mainly Gentile Judeo-Christian world is that the citizens of nations, generally speaking, are too uninformed to do the pushing. In fact, they are not only underinformed, they are misinformed, conditioned, one could even say brainwashed to accept a version of history, as Moshe mentioned, which is simply not true. And this has happened in large part because the mainstream media, like almost all politicians, is terrified of offending Zionism. Now it follows that if governments are to be pushed to do what is necessary to bring the conflict in and over Palestine to an end, if, in other words, the citizens of nations are to be empowered to take part in informed and honest debate, to make democracy work for justice and peace. It follows, I believe, that there is an absolute first requirement, and that is the liberation of the citizens of the Western nations. Liberation from the tyranny of Zionism's propaganda lies, upon which the first draft of Judeo-Christian history is constructed. The good news is that the tools to make this liberation possible 
are now available. They are books which expose Zionism's version of history for the propaganda nonsense it is. The core essence of this nonsense is that there was no ethnic cleansing of Palestine, that poor little Israel has lived in danger of annihilation and driving into the sea of its Jews, and that Israel had no partners, Palestinian or Arab, for peace. Israel's existence has never ever been in danger from any combination of Arab military force. And that Zionism's assertion to the country was the cover which allowed Israel to get away where it mattered most with presenting its aggression of self-defense and itself was the victim when actually it was and is the oppressor. In terms of racism, there is no difference between apartheid South Africa and Zionist Israel. The Zionists, however, have the biggest weapon that was not available to South Africa apartheid. Bigger than F-16s, tanks and nuclear missiles put together. It's called the Holocaust. The Holocaust allows Zionists to manipulate world public opinion and to stifle any possible open discussion. It is simply their biggest asset. Today, to be an anti-Zionist is construed as being anti-Semitic, and to be anti-Semitic can send you to prison in Europe. happening before our eyes and yet Israel gets away with it. How, how could that be? South Africa didn't get away with it. You know everybody's criticizing China for its oppression. How does Israel get away with it? And that's one of the real problems that we have. One reason is of course is because um, of the media that tries to be even-handed or pro-Israeli. Zionism has a credibility, the idea that Israel is a Jewish state has a credibility that apartheid never had in South Africa. Uh, Christians that are critical hesitate to speak out because they're afraid of being smeared as anti-Semites. So you find very little criticism of Israel in the media. Part of it is, of course, the fact that we're dealing with Jews. So the non-Jewish world feels guilty the Holocaust feels guilty about the Jew, Jewish issue and so on. It's used politically in a very effective way, in a very cynical way. I mean, it's very hard to say this, but I think it's true. It's seen as a very useful PR tool. You know, the way the, the government plays on, um, on the guilt in Europe over the Holocaust so that you can't criticize us. Look what you did to us, you see. It intimidates non-Jews. It closes up discussion. It's very effective, and Israel is willing for the sake of its PR and to silence critics, it's willing to sell the victims of the Holocaust. Israel is willing for the sake of its PR and to silence critics, it's willing to sell the victims of the Holocaust. It's willing to sell the victims of the Holocaust. The sad fact is that those six million Jews that died because of a fascist, racist ideology are cynically being used today to justify and support another fascist, racist ideology. As most of my family on both sides were amongst the victims of the Holocaust, I withdraw my permission from Israeli government and Zionist worldwide to use their death in such a hideous way. Interested to know what you can do about it? <laughs> 
insists that your government challenges Israel and its racist fascist ideology of Zionism. I made this documentary so none can say in the future, we didn't know. Now you know, so you can act. I also made this documentary because I have a huge debt to the Palestinians. One part of the debt is simply growing up in Israel. It sounds rather abstract to say I grew up on someone else's land. It is more to the point to say that I grew up in a block of flats in a suburb built on once beautiful olive and orange groves. I have no idea what happened to the owners of those groves. But if they are alive, they certainly live either in exile or in terrible conditions in a refugee camp. Another part of my debt is taking an active part in the occupation as a paratrooper and reserve soldier. In Israel, about 5% of the population serves as reserve soldiers. And except for the professional soldiers, they are the only Israelis who ever get to see firsthand what actually happens in the occupied territories. The rest of the Israelis see only army-controlled glimpses on television. Being part of that 5%, I saw occupation from close, and I will never take part in that again, even if it means going to prison for desertion. Zionism's main defense is not money, it is not military might, but a wall of propaganda lies. If one or two of the main bricks in this wall can be dislodged, the whole edifice might collapse faster than any of us might dare to imagine. Now to that I'll add these very last few words of my own. Let us recognize that our time has come. You've heard those words somewhere else, I think. Our time has come. Because the truth of history does make Zionism vulnerable. And that means that Zionism can be successfully challenged, checked and defeated. Thank you. Mama!